I just want to say welcome to everyone um, to the first in this ABC of yoga and health. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Colin. I'm a yoga therapist and a yoga therapist trainer. Um, and this is my colleague Stanford, Dr. Stanford Wong, um, a, a specialist in Perhaps you'll introduce yourself, Stanford, a little more. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Stanford. I, I'm a medical doctor, worked a few years in maternity, and now just recently gone into psychiatry. Also a yoga teacher and a trainee to Colin's yoga tra uh, therapy, therapy training. Cool. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. We've, we've chosen the, the theme of anger today. Um, it's because when we were talking about this, we sort of sat down and we kind of went, well, the most common thing we see at the moment is anxiety. And I think there's a lot of talk about anxiety, a huge amount of talk about anxiety. However, what I feel a lot of is, and I feel a lot with all the people that I'm working with are coming across is anger. And it sounds very strange. I was listening to Radio 2. I don't know if any of you listen to Radio 2. But Radio 2. I'm driving in my car listening to Radio 2. And um, they're talking about, you know, the inter-family conflicts that are happening over COVID. You know, one person thinks one thing, another person thinks another thing. And so what we're starting to do is we're starting to see that when someone believes in one thing and someone else believes in something else, it's not just on a group basis, it starts to become an individual basis. And families are having a huge amount of conflict now because they all believe different things. Um, so I think that anger is sort of prime with regard to a subject matter. So um, the first thing is, well, I think I'll hand over to Stanford to begin to look at the Western aspect of this. And we can sort of all bounce back forwards and backwards if that's okay. Sure. Um, by the way, this is kind of like between me and Paul, uh, Colin, we kind of just hand it over straight away. So if I see my bed and pepper, that's completely normal. I'm just going to go into, as I said, I'm in the Western medicine. Most of the time I dabble a little bit in Chinese medicine. So I occasionally will bring that in, but I doing a little bit of work and research on anger. And it seems in the Western psychology, it kind of range from like the mildest form would be like a, a little bit irritation, you know, like someone else take your parking spot when you were queuing for it to like, murderous rage and that seems to be the range and maybe we don't think about anger like that sometimes we just think about anger as in the angry face from you know the disney inside our movie but sometimes actually it's a whole range of how you can express it and in some schools even they even say depression is a part of expression of anger as well and again there are so many areas of anger we can talk about i think some example later on or now might be a useful thing to go through and i'm sure colin will go through some of them as well i was just going to say perhaps one of the most relevant example at the moment maybe just because of the um life situation i've heard a lot recently is about grief um, I'm sure most of you are aware of the five stage of grieving and anger has a lot of time being, you know, incorporated into the five stage, just in case you want to know the other four is denial, bargaining, depression, as well as acceptance, uh, which hopefully will be the final stage. So uh, anger, just want to illustrate how many different expression, how many different areas you can see anger in. Um, just going to give one more funny fact about, well, interesting fact about that before I hand it back to Colin is actually the five stage of grief initially wasn't designed for people who are grieving. They are designed for people who are actually themselves going through the terminal illness or the cancer diagnosis. And that's why the, the cycle go through like that. Recently, when I was um, looking into psychotherapy and how people are going through grief themselves, you know, for someone else they love, actually the process is a lot more complicated you, because there's not a sustainable way to just stay in the acceptance stage. You kind of constantly cycling through all these emotions, which once again, just illustrate how anger is really normal and just part of the human emotion spectrum. It's not something that we necessarily have to take away from our lives, so to speak. Hopefully that. No. Good start. Colin. Thank you. Uh, one thing that you've just said so beautifully is that you've mentioned grief and you've mentioned the link between anger and grief. Um, I want to go in two directions with anger, if that's okay. Um, yoga is very interesting because it, it, in, in yoga we have the word kroda, which, which means anger. It means wrath. It means anger. It, it appears actually in 
quite a number of texts. It appears in Yoga Sutra in chapter 234. It also appears within the Bhagavad Gita in the second, third and fourth chapters. Um, it also appears in a text called the Yoga Rahasya. And so for me, anger is very interesting because actually it forms part of the overall process that we're coming to work with when we're working with yoga. I, I want to take just the first idea that you came up with, um, Stanford, which is that it, when, when we've got anger, we've got numbers of different sort of directions that come out of this. Um, you mentioned grief, grief shoka in Sanskrit. It, it, it's, it's, there's a link between anger and grief, but there's also some stuff that's beneath anger as well. And I think I'd like to begin to investigate this with you in a second. Um, but I also want to bring up a couple of other sort of situations, emotions that come up with anger present, such as jealousy. Okay, jealousy, hatred, arrogance, delusion, regret. Um, you know when someone gets really offended, there's, there's an underlying aspect of anger within this as well. Um, when people put other people down, bitching, this type of thing. Um, it, it, there's, there's kind of, there, there is this kind of thread of anger through it. But interestingly enough, yoga looks at anger in, in two ways. It looks at it in is in 50% and 50%. It means it's 50% good, and it's also 50% not so good as well. And we're mentioning a lot of the stuff that's not so good. Um, but what I want to jump back on is I want to look at the stuff that's not so good. Sorry, the stuff that's good as well as not so good. Um, but before we do this, I want to build back a little further to say what is anger built upon, and, and then hand back over to you, Stanford. Um, according to the yoga text is in chapter 337 of the Bhagavad Gita. It, it says, um, desire transforms into anger when the desire is not fulfilled. So what we start to get is we start to get a, a very interesting idea with regard to there is a want for something. There is a desire for something. There's a thirst for something. I want to be heard, I want to be noticed, I want to be seen, I want to be right, I want to be, I want, I want. So there's a desire that comes into this. And then there is another root of this as well, which is attachment. So I'm, I'm quite fixed on something. So I am right. Okay, so I am right and I want. Um, suddenly we start to get a combination of attachment, we start to get that combined with a desire and we start to get ego. So in a way we've actually got a pyramid, a foundation that actually forms underneath that when challenged actually comes to create an ignition, a fire of anger. Um, Stanford. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're just building on um, your idea. Oh, by the way, this is not really scripted. We both me and Colin have different research area and we just kind of build on each other's idea a little bit. So if anyone have any question, Paul with which is kind of the wizard behind the curtain is also on this call. If you have any problem, if you just raise a hand, I think there's a function that you can click on somewhere or give either Colin or me a chat. We can answer as we go along as well. We're more than happy to have take questions. Um, just building on the idea of good and bad. Um, as I said, modern psychology view anger as a spectrum and um, from mild form to you know murderous rage uh, but also actually split into three components a little bit the first one is kind of like hasty and sudden uh, which kind of describe when instinctively you have to protect yourself and these are the angers that we get observed in animals uh, they kind of come once the danger is gone it's kind of like the sympathetic nervous system you know the fight and flight response once the danger is removed you kind of go away the second one slightly more developed, I think slightly more into the monkey brain, you know, our, our primal brain, where it's about um, reacting to a settled and deliberate uh, episodes. So that means anything that's kind of threatened to us, either physically, sometimes psychologically, we can speak a little bit into trauma as well. Sociologically, we can see a lot of people getting angry about so social injustice. So these are the slightly second form, which relates a little bit more into the thinking. And the last one is the dispositional. So these are the ones that when the personality trait, they tend to have a slightly more anger or almost aggression dis uh, disposition. Once again, I'm not talking about just pathology. It can just be a normal, normal human being again. So th these are the ones that we kind of uh, see in modern um, Western psychology. 
we they don't go into attachment or ego so much so i'm going to leave that part largely to colin to discuss because he has lots of sutra and, um, in his pocket that he can talk to you about um but i think it's a really good way to illustrate how anger can be useful and not useful because sometimes anger as most of us have heard it kind of like one of the seven deadly sins you know is rough but actually there's a really protective mechanism about them. When our survival is being threatened, when you know, physically or emotionally, any way that we've been threatened, we want to, it to be part of our emotion to uh, protect ourselves because we want to be able to express ourselves. Uh, sometimes you see that in certain babies. You know, sometimes we're saying, oh, this only two months old, why, why when the baby's crying, it has such an angry tone in it? Because it's part of the emotional tool belts that we have. Uh, in order to express what we want and um, when something especially is really not sitting well with us, uh, whichever level it is. But there's also one that is uh, more harmful and when the harmful side start coming out, sometimes it can express itself into like a bit more overprotective, can be a little bit more hostility, entitlement, frustration, even intimidation, uh, rationalizing, things like that as well. So these are slightly less harmful way and I think it might be a good time just to throw it back to Colin just to see what he has to say about that. What I found very interesting is just what you said a second ago with regard to um, anger coming out as a threat. So, interesting enough if you think about most of us at the moment is that we feel because our worlds have all changed and our worlds are constantly changing we feel under threat quite a lot. And so actually what you've got is you've actually got this, this pressure that everyone is feeling because they feel so much under threat that it, the reaction times, like you mentioned with this small baby, it's, it's like a protective mechanism. So the anger that we're actually expressing is a protective mechanism. So I find that really, really interesting. Really interesting. Um, so... In yoga, we, we, we can categorize it in numbers of different ways. We can, we can categorize it in a, almost a, a physiological way. We can categorize it as, as, a, as a sort of a mechanism of a physical being. I'm sort of angry in my physical being. I can find that there'll be symptoms of this that will run through the physicality of the body. And I know, Stanford, you've got some symptoms of this that I'd like to hand over to give to you. But, um, but there are some, there's some, some physical symptoms with regard to anger. So perhaps if you run through those because first, and then I can sort of build on this a little more because there's a change in energy within the system when anger is present. And also there's a change within the mind when anger is present. And there is also what happens is that when our belief system is actually challenged, then what we find is we find that there's quite a lot of anger involved. Um, let me hand, can I hand over to you, Stanford, to talk about just the symptoms, first of all? Of course. Um, so, again, Western psychology or medicine usually categorise the symptoms of anger pretty much the same as the sympathetic nervous system. So, for just a bit of background, just in case you're not quite familiar with that word. So, in our um, nervous system, so the the nerves and the brains how how control our body split into two parts or one way to split in, split it is into two parts sympathetic nervous system so basically where all the stress cortisol you know uh, reactive situation how we deal with it is called sympathetic nervous system also called flight or fight and the other one is parasympathetic uh, nervous system so that's when we're resting when we're restoring when we're digesting when we are away from danger that's when we use that system a little bit more so obviously when we are fighting when we're Flighting, so we want heart rate to go up, so we might feel a heart pounding. Where uh, the blood pressure will definitely go up because we want more blood going everywhere in our body. Uh, we're going to start shutting down our um, digestive system, so our stomach, our intestine, so less likely to actually. Um, spend energy and blood flow into those whilst actually pumping blood into our muscles so we can run a little bit faster. Sometimes uh, our, even our pupils actually dilate because when animals, which include us, are running around trying to fight off um, any dangers, we want to be able to see what's around us so that we know which direction to run, run to and away from. So these are the few things that we can see already um, how, how human as animal being can actually tune to them. Is that what you want to, Colin? Thank you. Very good. I give you a good score for that. Thanks. <laughs> um, it, so in yoga, it, the 
physicality. So the interesting thing about yoga is the physical aspect, the thing that we kind of engage with, this material physical aspect, the body, it's the cause of something deeper. So what's happening is that when there is the expression within the body, when there is the clenching of the fist, when there is the changing of the blood circulation, when there is the, the, the heat that's rising within the body, when there is the dryness that's coming into the mouth, when there is the changing of the pupils of the eyes, this is happening from something deeper, according to yoga. It's, it's, it's saying that it, the cause is deeper and the effect comes into and outwards into the surface. And so the physical symptoms actually tell us what's going on. And the physical symptoms are, are symptoms like, you know, just not the physical structure that Stanford's talking about, but also the way that we use our words. And how we work with anger or use anger or hold anger or allow ourselves to be angry, not be angry, suppress anger, recognize anger, be aware of anger, have the permission to communicate about what makes us angry, all forms part of the process that needs to be looked at within yoga. So we would look at it in the way that actually something deeper is the cause and actually on the surface you start to see the effect, the way that we interact with ourselves and also the way that we interact with other people and also the way that we interact with the world. So we start to get lots of points of interaction and it's through those points of interaction where we have attachments, where we have desires, where we have identifications that we can get friction points with regard to anger. And so the, you've got the physicality in one way, our energy goes up and down. So with anger, you can actually, your energy can come right the way up and you can do amazing things with anger, but it can also go right the way down as well. It can actually, you can have no energy whatsoever if you're very angry or if there's a suppression of anger within the system. So you can find that actually the energy of the system can fluctuate dependent on how the person is interacting with themselves and with other people and the coherence between that interaction as well. And the way that the mind is working, the way that the mind is working is, is key for us in yoga with regard to how we view anger, how aware we are of what makes us angry and how we communicate and how we express that. And how we and what we believe is also crucial to this process as well because the belief that we have is linked to our story and our story creates the framework that we have that sets us up for a situation where we become very attached to certain things so thank you Stanford you've started to build the, the physiology um, around this which I find very very interesting um, and how it how does anger, can I ask a question, um, how does anger manifest um, with regard to human behavior? Is that to me or to the audience? <laughs> that's, that's to you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> um, so one model that I can find that people express anger is actually three different ways, which I, I already alert to it a little bit. So the most obvious type would be the aggression. So, you know, when you, uh, when you see examples of bullying, destruction, sometimes grandiose, hurtfulness, uh, also interestingly risk-taking and selfishness, because remember, parts of the anger expression is not just to other people, but the anger can be directed to self as well. So that can actually be part of the spectrum. Uh, the second one is a passive form, which you see a lot. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to touch on that, but you know, when you see a loved one and you had an argument, the other person like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then clearly it's not fine. You know, uh, you can see in their eyes, they just don't want to talk about it, but it doesn't mean that it has gone away. And so that's an anger in that kind of expression as well. So this passion, evasiveness, defeatedness, sometimes a bit of obsession and also manipulation, psychologically speaking as well. So that is the passive form. And the last one is more assertive anger when, you know, active trying to go out to either punish something, blame something. Um, again, I think this one also touched a little bit on the social injustice when you see really active group of people coming into that. I think that will be the expression of anger. Uh, but if it's okay, Colin, I'm going to take a little bit of time just to expand one of the idea because you, you touched on something very interesting. It's about how our mind works with anger. Uh, I just, so I just want to go through this 
model that I learned during lockdown because I was going through my own notes and I find so fascinating. It's called the free brain model. Mm -hmm. So in a brain, if you have seen a brain image or if you want to Google one, uh, so it has like almost like three layers. So the lowest one around the brain stem is the reptile bed brain. So these are the ones that actually kind of largely control all the flight and fights, you know, or the basic instinctive response. So that's what you see in reptile animals. They just want to go for their survival and then, you know, and then that's it. They don't think about anything more. One layer up is called the, uh, the mouse brain or the mammal brain. So that is the one that has a little bit more about emotion, a little bit of short-term memories. Uh, it contains a little bit of uh, interaction, relationships. However, these are still very short-lived. It's, um, it's not very coherent. So that's why you see mouse compared to a reptile, they're slightly better at protecting themselves. They can form clangs a little bit better. They think a little bit more about the survival of the species instead of just themselves. The highest level, primate, so the monkey brain, literally, um, it, that is the layer, kind of like a higher cortex, cortical thinking about um, exec executive functions, about how we kind of use our thinking a little bit more. And sometimes this is the layer that, you know, gives humans such a good uh, scientific advancement as well as emotional, as well as all the other facets that we have, that we can see in modern days, including our iPhones. Um, however, it's also the culprit of a lot of our problems because this is the layer when all these emotions and survival instincts can stay in our body. Because when you're a mouse and a reptile, if you have a flight or a stress response, you deal with it, once it's gone, once it's removed, done. If you have a bit of memory of it, it's there for a short period of time and then it's done. And then they don't live with these experience. However, we as human being, we're very good at remembering these uh, problems. You know, the prime example would be PTSD, post-traumatic um, post disorder. And these are the things when, you know, these experiences keep coming back to haunt us. And that's sometimes why we see such anger expressed in so many different forms. It's not because we are constantly live in danger, my, you know, despite what we're doing, going through right now, which is actually true. Um, but when it's in peaceful time, we still have the memories of the danger. We still have the experience of the danger within our body. And these are all still very real because of a higher brain function. Sorry, slight detour. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I actually, I, what I really liked is your, your introduction of memory into this. Because for me, and a Buddha Visha Sam Pramosha Smriti, it's memory is born out of experience and it never dies. And this is, a, this is a Yoga Sutra 111, it, it's two and a half thousand years old. And I, I reflect on this so much when I'm working with people who are angry, they're in traumatic situations, they don't know how to deal with what's gone on in their lives. They don't know how to deal, they want to continue and they think that everything's okay, but it's not okay. They know that they need to let go of something, they need to process something, they need to go through something, but they almost in a way are very frightened to allow that door to open, that, that thing to come out. Memory for me is something very powerful because it's, it's not something that just resides within the head, it resides within the whole body. So this for me links very strongly back to what we discussed earlier with regard to the physicality of anger. Um, how, Anger actually holds us in a particular way. So the word kroda, it, it means it comes from the root dart, which means to hold. Um, so it can hold us. We can be held by it. We can be held within anger. Um, so I find that quite interesting. The way that memory and experience come together and the patterns that we take and the pathways that we take associated with the different interactions that we have, I think is crucial because each story that I'm coming across with each of the people that I'm working with is completely unique. It really is. It means that the way that everyone interacts with themselves is unique. The way that they're interacting with other people is unique. The situations they're in are also unique. However, there's a number of common themes within this, especially when there's anger involved. And in most cases, there is anger involved, as Stanford mentioned, in numbers of different ways. It's either really expanded and really out there, or it's very kind of passive, or it's very suppressed and pushed down. And if you suppress and push something down, it has to leak out in numbers of different ways. And so it, it, I'm seeing situations where I'm talking to people and I'm saying to them, and we're, we're discussing things. So I was with someone this week and 
you know, she said to me, you know, I just don't fit your models at all. You know, I, I'm having this conflict with, with, with my mother-in-law and I'm having this conflict and it, it, you know, I just don't fit into the family and she doesn't like me. And, you know, I just, I basically turned around and said, you are really, really angry at her. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not angry at her at all. I'm really, I'm not angry. And we, we started talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And we're practicing and talking and practicing. She goes, I'm really, really angry. You're completely right. And almost in a way, sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to sort of go through a whole sort of series of things to really accept that actually we're angry about a situation so that we can start to step back from it. Because when we're very involved in it, really heavily involved in situations, we're attached, we are very invested in it, so there's a big desire within it. And also we identify, you know, I want to be the very good you know, daughter-in-law. I want to be very, you know, a very good daughter-in-law. I want to be seen in this way. I want to be seen in that way. And it, it creates this kind of friction, this underlying friction that's there. Um, Stanford, would you like to add any more to this as we've just started to build out this area? Yeah, I, you know what, actually, in terms of anger management, I think you said one of the most beautiful way of dealing with it. And from my point of view, and I think the Western psychology concurred, there's not much more that we can add on because the good and the bad news is there's no medication. There's no super drug about it. You know, none of them help. Um, suppression and deflection are not effective because as I said already, anger is natural. It's just part of expression and it will stay within us because of our brain function. So if you try to suppress it, if you try to deflect it, they will just come back to haunt us. And the, all these fight and flight response, you don't want to keep them, keep having them coming back without good reason, because it will just exhaust you and uh, deplete you. So from our side, it's mostly the same thing as Colin has said. You know, you kind of have to discuss through them. You have to reflect. Some people say journaling. Some people will say CBT, which is cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. So you kind of from your behavior you're trying to manipulate or change the way that your thinking goes so kind of in a way rewire rewiring your brain is how i always see it so that's a really good way so i'm not going to expand any more on those i'm just going to bring a little bit of chinese medicine in because i'm conscious of time and i want to make sure that you all have some opportunity to ask questions if there's any um i think from the chinese medicine side um as much as i've dabbled Again, it just shows that anger is such a normal part of our living because it's within the five basic elements, which is wood, fire, water, earth, and metal, and it's correlating to wood. Um, and actually, it has a bit of saying that when you uh, have liver imbal imbalance or heat stagnation in the liver, it will bring on more anger because there's an imbalance in the expression. So things like lack of sleep, alcohol, caffeine, oily food, lack of fresh fruits and vegetables, these will all kind of be part of the things that can lead to an overexpression of your anger. So from that point of view, something that maybe can look into your life. Um, and the other thing, I'm actually thinking about this a lot, because as I said, there's always emotion um, correlated to each element. However, it doesn't sit well with me that the emotion correlator is always kind of almost like a negative one, even if it's necessary. Because wood uh, energy is about structure, it's about growth, it's about having a framework. And really dislike when it's going outside of this organization, outside of this structure, hence it expresses itself as anger. However, again, like you can't have good without the bad, you can't have light without the dark. Mm -hmm. So what's the other side of anger? It's about letting go. It's about kind of almost like forgiveness, not just for other people, it's mostly for yourself, really. When we're, ang when we're angry, I think I've heard one of the most amazing, amazing share during one of my training is, actually, when we're angry at someone, most of the time it's because we see a mirror in the other person. We see something that we have done or could have done or will have done, and we're angry at that, and we're angry at ourselves a little bit. So I think um, an important part of dealing with anger is actually just letting go and forgiving and mostly not the other person is actually ourself. And back to Colin. <laughs> so what you're suggesting here is why it appears in all these yoga texts, because it's a very, very important mechanism. It's an important mechanism, which is actually a release valve of the body. It's there to give you an opportunity to let you know that something needs to be looked at. So, 
it's almost like an urge. It's almost like something that can needs to come out. I think that's really interesting, Stanford. Um, in in Ayurveda, we look at it slightly differently. It's 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 and in yoga, it's very different as well. In yoga, it's um, it's rajasic. It's it's a, it's a moving force. So anger itself is is rajas. It's 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 un, if when it gets unbound, which means that it, it starts to push away all of its boundaries, it turns into violence. So violence is unsupported rajas, rajas without tamas supporting it. Um, so it goes from anger into violence. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, they give it a beautiful evolution. Um, now the evolution I find quite interesting because it, it's almost the evolution of an argument um, that two people can have. And one of my favorite things is when, I, when I'm talking to people and I say, look, how many of you have arguments with each other? And in the room, everyone's sitting there like this, going, okay, no, we don't argue. We don't argue. No, no, we're really good. We don't argue. And then I start saying, look, how many of you, when you're arguing, because none of you argue with your partners or with anyone else, how many, when you're arguing, actually can see yourself arguing with someone? And quite a few people say, yeah, I can. And I say, how many of you, when you're actually having that argument, you're, you're, you're arguing away, you keep going with the argument, even though you can change it in the opportunity, you can actually do something different at any time, point in time. And quite a few people are kind of like looking at me, just sort of looking down and sort of, sort of like this, going, well, you know, actually I could do something about it, but I don't because I'm keeping on going because I need to get my point across and I need to make sure that, and almost I need to complete what I've started. And there is some sort of, Something is lost if I change my pattern during that anger, during that argument and actually sort of go, hey, you know, you're completely right. Or change the way that I'm doing something because I actually see it. Now, for me, this is an important thing because in this evolution that's given within the Bhagavad Gita is they say that from attachment, so having attachment, and it's very important to know that in order to live, you need to be attached, okay? You need attachment to live. Many people are talking about non-attachment, detachment, but actually in yoga, you need to be attached to live. Your consciousness needs to be attached to your matter in order for you to be alive, to, for there to be life within you. So they say that fundamentally, there is attachment in life. The moment you live, you're attached, okay? so. It's not that what you're doing is you've got to detach from everything. It's that actually fundamentally part of life comes attachment. From attachment, desire is born. Okay? And you have to have a desire for life. You have to have a will for life. You have to have a zest for life. You have to want to live. Okay? So desire, fundamentally wanting to live, comes from this point here. So these are two important things that you need positively in your life. Okay? One, attachment to desire. Positive, you need them. You've got to live. The next thing is that from desire, now desire, if we define desire as, as desire transforms into anger when not fulfilled, it means that I'm wanting something. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, almost a thirst that desire starts to move outwards and I want something. And as I create this one, it's not fulfilled and it's at that point within yoga this movement goes into anger and once we get into anger we start to twist situations it means that delusion kicks in so at the root of delusion is anger we start to become deluded about things you know i, I turn around and said well she said this and he said that and they said this and they said that and i can go through again and again this sort of the way that people start to twist everything because the anger, this flame of anger, this fire of anger starts to distort absolutely everything that's happening. And then with that delusion comes bewilderment, you know, disorientation, bewilderment. I don't know. I can't remember. I, 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 this, this sort of this bewilderment um, comes into existence. And from there, from that bewilderment comes confusion. I don't know where I left my car. I don't know. You, 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 I don't know anything. I don't, really don't know a thing. And it means that from that comes a loss of memory. 
And so there becomes memory loss as part of this as well. And this leads to the destruction of our deeper personality, of our deeper being, of who we are. So, and it destroys us as people. So for me, I really like this thread that is given from this yoga text because what it does is it, is it gives us an opportunity for us to firstly look at ourselves as part of a process. And for me, one of the most interesting things is that almost all of us can pick ourselves up when we're having an argument because actually you're involved in the argument. You can, you're, you're, you know, it's, it's a physical interaction with someone. Your, your mouth is opening and closing. You don't know what's coming out of it, but something sharp and hard is coming out of it quite often or something quite underhand is coming out of it. You, you are aware of what's happening. And it's at that point that you can almost stop this thread from expanding and going outwards. Um, so for me, it, anger is built on two very important things. It, it's built on attachment we need. It's built on desire that we need. And when those go out of balance, there becomes a problem. It's also combined with our ego, our personality as well. So you put these three things together and suddenly what you have is a very, very interesting mix. Um, so Stanford, is there anything? No, I think it's great. And because we have such a great time, I just wonder if anyone have any questions or anything that they would like to ask or add or share just because we bombard you with quite a lot of information <laughs> in the last 35 minutes. <laughs> so should, should I just, should we just, so we quickly recap and then we ask for questions. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds perfect. Yeah. So um, do you want to recap from a Western medical perspective uh, and anger? Yeah. So I think from Western side now, modern days, we moved away from, you know, being the, one of the seven deadly sin to be just part of the normal human uh, emotional spectrum. There are different ways that you can express it. It can be very passive, it can be very active, can also be more assertive, you know, in terms of how you stand in the world. It can be part of your personality traits, it can be short-lived, it can be long-lasting. Uh, ultimately, it's things that we all have to deal with and live with. There's no magic bullet or a medication they can sort out, and suppression or deflection is really not the way forward. <laughs> Thank you. And in yoga, it, anger is hugely important. Um, it, it comes from the inside and expresses itself outwards. It, it can be the power or the force which can actually allow you to transform something and do something. So actually what anger can do is it can be the way that you can ride to huge success, or it can be the thing that swallows you whole and drowns you. So it can go in either direction with anger. So you can actually ride anger very, very well, or it can sink you. Um, there are huge combinations of physical, energetic, mental, emotional effects with regard to anger that we see in lots of different ways. Um, when we combine anger with our actions, we start to get something interesting. So it's like cocktail making. So in cocktail making, it's quite interesting. You, you know, if you've got a cocktail in a bar, you've, you've kind of got one drink, another drink, another drink, another drink. And so you've, you, you sort of, you're starting to mix these things like this and you put a little bit of anger in with a situation and you combine it with another situation and combine it with another one, you start to get things that actually don't taste very good. And so in yoga, when we're looking at how we're acting, we're looking at not just the action of the anger itself we're looking at the effect of the action so the consequence of the action the impression that's left after that has happened and also what other actions come out of that as part of it so we start to look at the sort of how these sequences are sort of coming together um we know that anger gives rise to lots of other different emotions such as jealousy, such as grief, such as hatred, such as arrogance, such as delusion, um, regret, um, feeling offended, insulted. Um, it, the question is, 
can we give ourselves permission to process anger? Is it better in or out? Is it in a way there's also within yoga, we look at short term and long term. So we look at short term anger, which is like a, an almost igniting fuse, which Stanford was mentioning, just something very short and very fast and it's done. And also there's kind of like a long term anger, a kind of deep bubbling, deep, deep underlying anger. Now, for me, these are two separate things, two separate areas. And there's also something else that I find very interesting is that there is anger that is derived from you. There's anger that someone else, you know, someone else inflicts something on you. So you're, you know, justified in being angry back at them. There is anger because of the world. But I've also come across inherited anger, which is kind of interesting as well. So it's not because of the person or because of the situation, but actually genetically, there seems to be something that's going on within the system as well. Um, I don't know. So, so there's, there seems to be sort of some various sort of quite sort of complex combinations around anger that I've seen. Um, the next question for me, and with what Stanford was saying so well, is that is there a secret practice? Is there a secret technique? Is there a fast way to overcome anger? Okay, has anyone please got a quick fix for anger? Is there a position, a yoga position, that actually deals with anger? And I have to be really honest, there isn't. I, you know, it, you, you know, there'll be a three minute sequence somewhere that you can find that someone will give you, which this, it, it doesn't work like this. It really doesn't work like this. I found that quite interesting as well. Um, So for me, the individual process that each of us need to go through um, becomes hugely important. My teacher once told me, he looked at me and he said, look, once a person has been angry in their life, really angry in their life and an angry person, and through a process of yoga changed so that actually they're really okay with things, they have to keep their eyes open because that anger can return at any point in time. It can come back at any point. And I found that very, very interesting. Um, very interesting. Stanford. So Colin, there was a question for Iris or maybe it is Iris, I'm not sure. Sorry if I said it wrong. Uh, saying, can you repeat the process of anger again? It is really interesting. So I'm not sure if the recapping survives or do you want Colin to repeat what he said again? But just to say as well, I think Colin and I are going to make these recording available for purchase later on. Because once again, we're kind of fitting about five hours of talk in each hour session. So if you want to go back and later on, just listen to them again. I think there's an option to do that as well. What do you think, Colin? Do you want to repeat the process? Yeah, of yeah definitely. Um, let's give an idea. Um, so I'm talking to this lady and, and she wants to be, she, she's saying to me, look, I, I'm, I'm a good mother. I, I want to be accepted into this family. Um, you know, this has been going on for 25 years. I, you know, and I'm just being put down all the time by my mother-in-law. You know, every time I see her, she just, she gets a comment and just keeps putting me down, putting me down, putting me down. So for me, there's a number of things here. There's, she believes she's a very good person. And she is, she is, she's very justified. She is a very good person. She's attached to being a very good person. She also wants to be liked by her mother-in-law. Okay, it's a desire to be liked, to fit in, to, you know, to be, you know, to be respected as well. She wants to be respected. You know, and I think a lot of us want this. A lot of us have these sort of different things within inside of us that we actually, you know, want to be respected for who we are. There's a desire to have this. And also we kind of believe we're a particular person. I'm a good person. Why is this happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? So there are these two things that are going on. So we've got this first thing which is the attachment and from attachment, desire is born. And then from that desire um, comes anger because actually she's trying too hard. She's like, really, I'll go for a walk with my mother-in-law, look after her, I'll do this, I'll do this. She, she has this 
constant, you know, this, 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 this movement turns into anger because there's this sort of almost in a way she's put down again and again and again, and it hits back at the things that she's attached to and the things that she wants. So the flame goes into anger. And then from anger, uh, we, we then get this, this kind of thing, you know, there some, must be something wrong with me. You know, what, what is it? I mean, what am I doing wrong? So we start to become deluded. We start to, there starts to be a change in the way that our minds work and that way we see quite clearly. We start to almost in a way put ourselves down. And we kind of go, well, what is it? Bewilderment, what, what, what's, 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 you know, what's, what's happening? And then from that, the next stage is that we start to be confused. We start to sort of go, well, you know, if you talk to a friend, they'll turn around and go, well, why are you making an effort with your mother-in-law? She obviously hates you. I mean, what, what's the point? But you're kind of going, no, I've got to make the effort. So you start to then go into this sort of behavior, which is really kind of distorted and confused. You think it's going to be different. There's a distortion of your memory. Okay. You think it's going to be different. Every time you go around there and sit down there, maybe she'll be nice to me this time. Not happening. So it becomes distorted. And what happens is that then there is it, it almost destroys the deeper intelligence within us. So this next step is that what happens is that, you know, she knows, she knows deep down actually genuinely what's happening, but actually it destroys all her intelligence and her personality. She doesn't feel worthy anymore. And actually she is really worthy. So this for me is the stepping process with regard to anger that I find really interesting. Um, and how actually it starts to create these threads of destruction. Um, and also, as you start to unpick these, and part of the process with yoga therapy and working within yoga is to begin to change the boundaries and the way that this is working much more, to begin to take steps to actually begin to protect ourselves, begin to take different decisions, begin to challenge our belief system even after 25 years of working in a particular way to begin to say no to certain things to begin to be not affected by certain things to take different routes and i think that is a very interesting process so did that answer the question she's nodding okay cool Colin, there's a, another question. I'm going to just shout them out as they come along. So Leah is asking, why are we as a society so afraid of anger? Are the strong emotions like passions and ambitions have quite positive association, but anger, our own and others, terrifies or embarrasses us? Is that to you or to me? I, I don't know. I, so I'm going to, just going to say a few words about it and I'm going to hand it over to you because I think everyone's more enjoying way more listening to you than my voice um oh no <laughs> I'm, I'm going on silent i'm going on silent i'm gonna listen to you don't do that, do that. Um, so i think it's partly how we are being raised uh, i've been reading a book lately on psychotherapy it's called i think you should talk to someone um or maybe you should talk to someone i can post a link later on it, it talks about how actually our society raised children most of the time you to hear parents saying oh don't cry don't be angry it, it seems to be we have a certain image of how children or people should behave which is smiling all the time running around happy you know listening be good boy good girl that's kind of the social mold and i think at a certain point if we keep having that mold uh, as we getting uh, as we got them raised uh, raised up uh, that that will change our mind and behavior a little bit just kind of like a very ingrained cbt um so i think that may have something to do with it i don't have a lot of data on in hand just to support that but i think that certainly from my own experience that is because i think you are rightly in to a certain extent passion and ambition we value them but actually to a certain extent we also dislike them because the society in general seems like everyone to fall in line a little bit you know you can display passion only to a certain extent you can only display sadness to a certain extent i mean nowadays we even say for grieving periods you are allowed to grieve for three months otherwise you get diagnosed with depression what we should all know by now you know everyone responds to things differently there's no right way or wrong way to do things you can grieve for one day half a day you can grieve for three years you know that largely depends on you the relationship you have with the other person 
And I think it's just the same for anger. You know, when is it too little? When is it too much? Is it doing anything good for you? Is it doing harm to yourself and to others? I think that the relativism is not being taught enough. That's my point of view. Colin? I would agree with that completely. Um, I think it's a very, very powerful emotion. I think it's a powerful emotion that we actually become very frightened of because actually, in a way, when you start to feel an emotion come up within you that you don't recognize, it's almost, it's, um, it, it's almost like getting on a horse for the first time and suddenly this horse starts to move and, 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 and have a mind of it and a, and a power of its own. And you don't know how to deal with it. You don't know how to work with it. You haven't been taught to work with it. So I think there's a lot within what you just said, Stanford, with regard to the way that we're brought up to express anger and to deal with anger and to process anger and to process the connected emotions associated with anger, to be able to communicate it without transferring it onto someone else as well. So the honesty and being able to sit there and go, look, this has really pissed me off. And actually to really genuinely say it, but without directing that tongue, that voice, that feeling to hurt someone else, to allow ourselves to take responsibility of it and to find some power within it rather than because quite often what I find is that people become angry and then they communicate that anger in a way that looks to destroy the other person and the other person doesn't know how to deal and cope with that person being angry. So I think there's a almost there's a sort of a, a twofold thing that needs to happen between, I don't know if this makes any sense, between two people and the way that anger's working. It's so, it does to me. Because I know that what happens is that one person needs to express the anger but without using the sword and the other person needs to realise that what's happening with the anger and maybe put up a small shield and just kind of look to the side and go I know you're angry I am listening I do respect you you know what I mean because they, they, they don't need to understand the trigger points for the anger as part of what's happening does that make sense Sanford yeah so I am um, just keep moving because I'm conscious of time Helena I think it kind of answer your question because your question is about as anger or the encouraging release of anger you know, that was the first part of the question, so hopefully we answer that. The second part is about how uh, anger seems to be creeping up sort of unconsciously and how to move towards being more aware. So I think Colin kind of already named it. I would just say from my example as well, um, so many like clinical or personal example I've seen, just giving the emotion a name is very, very powerful just for someone to recognize or just say that I am angry or for someone else to recognize that you are angry is kind of one of the most powerful tool we have in terms of our communication skills. Um, because as being a doctor, we have been trained a lot in communicating. And actually, when you see someone angry, saying calm down or slow down is actually probably the one of the most inflammatory thing you can ever say. Um, however, you recognize that emotions like, I can see that you're very, very angry, or I can understand why you feel angry because of what you have been through. I think a lot of the time just naming it is, it's very important and um, just one quick example if I can. Um, so when I was in maternity, I saw a new mother of uh, her firstborn and she was very tearful for about two days and to the extent that her sister started, you know, diagnosing her with postnatal depression, so on and so forth. I say, okay, let's just slow down before any clinical diagnosis. Your newborn mother, I think she was something like 20 years old, so clearly a little bit out of her depth, which I think most of us can relate in some one way or another. And I was just saying, I think you're very anxious. It's very normal to be anxious, but within the first 15 minutes of the conversation, she will keep denying, no, I'm not anxious, I'm fine, I'm doing okay, I just don't know why I can't I keep crying. And towards the end, we have that conversation where Ashley, you may be right. Ashley, I'm 20 years old. This is my first baby. I don't even know how to hold my baby. I don't know why my baby is crying. I'm completely out of my death. And I think once you kind of do enough reflection and discussing what is going on and then just give all these emotion a name, there's such a power to it. And then you can start working from there. So that would be my answer to your second part of question. Helena, if that's okay. 
Colin, anything else to add? No, I, 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 th I think that we, I think there's, there's a couple of things. One is that the naming process becomes very important, but the recognize, recognizing and being aware of it within ourselves also becomes important because sometimes there's no awareness at all. You know, like you said, with this lady that you're talking to, and often a lot of people I'm talking to, they're not aware of it at all. So firstly, there's got to be a movement from awareness into the fact that actually there is an understanding that anger is present often in an argument so there is some anger there then there is a sort of a deeper awareness on short and longer term anger and then there is even more of a deeper awareness about the anger that we have which is linked to feeling and having a good feeling and feeling within ourselves now interestingly enough the often the processes that we go through on nearly everything take very similar patterns so in a way we in one way we will suppress or push something down and when we do another action we'll do a similar behavior we'll suppress and push something down as well so we'll start to see within the way that we start to interact out into the world we'll start to use that as a mechanism to see how we don't talk or we do talk or we over talk or under talk or how we you know that fire comes up within us and, and how we you know what do we do with that point you know when we become bright red and we want to explode or just the capacity to start to be aware of all of these different things um helps with regard to sort of actually unraveling and uncovering this whole process because we, we, we tend to take the same routes again and again and again. We think it's different, but actually it's not. It's we take the same again and again and again. And, and I think each time we interact with someone else, with ourselves, with the world, it's a huge opportunity. And it's an opportunity when we get the feeling of anger, because it's there to say that we're being challenged at a particular level. And if I'm being challenged at a particular level, that could be a level with regard to something I want or a, a story that I've told about myself then what I've got is I've got a massive opportunity to say, is this really justified? Or is it that actually I need to do some work on myself and actually look, actually look at firstly the situation. In yoga, this is called avastar. I look at the situation that I'm in and the easiest thing we can change is the situation or the lack of the time aspect of things or something deeper, the dharma aspect of things. So, it means that there's a huge opportunity when I have the feeling of anger. Massive opportunity. Colin, yeah. just because I think supposedly we only have two minutes left and as I can see there's four questions we still have to touch on, so shall we divvy it up? Um, so Carol, your question about misinterpretation results in anger and aphidia, I think um, hopefully Colin's last answer kind of touched on that already. I think misinterpretation definitely can result in anger. I don't think it's exclusively the only thing. It has so many ways that anger can be created. And I, I agree, I think it definitely can. And the other one that I'm gonna take, I think will be anger can be uh, from uh, Ke uh, Karen, which is anger can be an expression of strong emotion feeling while you encounter, uh, encounter professional disagreement where emotion are suppressed. It's the latter, the riskier form of anger. I think from personal experience and from what my research has shown, uh, suppression is never a good way. Just because, you've, you know, if you keep, just imagine if you have a big pan of boiling water, if you put the lid on it, but you still crank up the heat at, you know, 120 degrees, it eventually is going to either burn the pot because all the water comes out or it's going to blow off the lid. It, you know, so keeping the lid on is never the uh, solution. You need to turn off the heat. Maybe you need to chat with the other person uh, that in this professional setting or any setting, or you have to distance yourself enough away from the situation where you can let off steam a little bit because just putting the lid on it is really not the way forward. So hopefully that answered that. Uh, for Colin, I'm going to give you two questions. The first one is from... Uh, Rani, which Rani. Is, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, what does Ayurveda say about food? Uh, what feeds anger? What pacifies it? And the other ones for Miles, can you briefly touch on learned anger and the genetic uh, propensity to anger? Okay, so um, very brief about Ayurveda and food is that it, it, foods that are tikshna, sharp, so sharp foods, 
increase the anger, the fire within the system. And so you'll find sharp, you'll find dry, you'll find over consumption of sweet foods will do similar things. Um, it, over salty foods as well will do the same thing. So lavender. It, it means that there are certain foods that will increase anger within the system. What pacifies it? Um, the opposite, liquidy. Um, yeah, how do I say? Liquidy, cooling, and things like uh, coriander, cilantro, um, these type of foods, all in the opposite direction. So bland foods, plain foods. Um, interestingly enough, we talked about, just as you were saying, just putting the lid on the pan and turning the heat up. Quite often when we are angry, we run, we fight, we go to the gym, we work out, and we feel much better. And for me, this is almost like taking the pan off the flame for a few moments. We feel better and it stops the simmering action. And then when we get back into the situation, we put it right back on again and it comes all the way back up again. So there, there are lots of mechanisms that we tend to put in place, whether they're um, food mechanisms. So when you eat when you're angry, it gives indigestion. Um, or there's sort of activity mechanisms that we come to do, um, like training, like fighting, like running. Um, and I've also got this other thing, is that we tend to put our anger into other skills to get some sort of success. I've always a great believer that the best comedians are always angry. You know, the funniest comedians. They are so angry. And then they become successful and they don't become funny anymore. So I know it's kind of strange. I, I've been really kind of thinking about this. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing thing, Anger. Um, so, and we'll bring it back to the last question because otherwise we're going to keep them for another hour, which easily can happen. It's about the genetic propensity of anger because I think that's one area we haven't quite touched on. So from my point of view, uh, if I can go first, there are certain uh, genetic conditions that can, that's associated with slight higher level of aggression. So mm -hmm. the one that I can think of on top of my head is something called XYY. So when, you know, um, that's an X gene and Y gene, X, X is female, XY is male. So if you have an extra copy of the Y as something called like the super male or the super men condition, that has a slight correlation to aggression. However, this is incredibly, incredibly, rare and I think as I said it, I think anger is just such a um, such an ingrained and needed emotion in the human being psyche um, some of us might have a slightly more anger disposition in us but in terms of genetic I think it's going to be very hard to find exactly which chromosome which gene which segment is going to be uh, linked to it um, just like, you know, if you want to find a happy gene, the sad gene, I think it's just going to be very, very difficult because it's, it's just part of us. Um, Colin, you might have something else to say about that from Ayurveda point of view. Um, this is a very, very interesting question. Learn anger. Um, I did an internship in a pupil referral unit and it was... And, and actually the, the, the module that I was running in this unit was called anger management. And we called it anger management rather than yoga meditation because actually many of the young people in there needed anger management. I remember my first day in there and I was sitting at the back of a classroom and this young lad just picked a chair up. And he got this chair and he threw it right the way across the room to the window and it bounced off the window and came back in. He looked at me directly in the eyes. Yes. And he sat down. And he was wearing his flat cap like this, chewing. And he went, I saw him a little bit later on, just sitting on this chair and went past him. He said, I'm dying for a cigarette. He must have been about 13 years old. 
and talking to the staff there, every one of his behavioural traits, everything that he was doing was learnt anger. It was all learnt. He learnt all of these different things. All of these different stuff was learnt. And to break people out of this, to show them there's a different route, um, I used to use lots and lots of different techniques, techniques to show how Bruce Lee would successfully win fights without fighting at all to show people that they can actually achieve things within their life and they don't have to take this learn anger pattern or this learn victim mentality so it's it's a so this learn anger i also see and come across and i've come across this in a number of different places and the genetic propensity to anger I don't know how to answer that if I'm really honest with you. I think it's it's a it, 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 there's a lot to it, and I don't know how to. I really honestly don't know how to answer it. So I'm sorry. We have to leave something to be desired from the first session, and then maybe we can touch up, up, up on it as a later date if that's opportunity. I think that might be the best way. Okay. Um, so from my perspective, um, my main message from today is it's okay to be angry. Stanford? I echo, don't put the lid on the pan, just turn the heat off or, you know, tone it down a little bit. You still want Brilliant. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, really, really looking forward to seeing you again in about three weeks' time. We're, we're going to be doing, um, I think we're going to talk about back pain. It is um, for back pain. Is for back pain. We have got a lot of experience in back pain, 25 years for me on back pain. And Stanford, you come across this on a regular basis. I've seen so many. Can't wait to share it. <laughs> Can't wait to share them to you all. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I really, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you for those questions. Um, and yeah, thank you.